Hey guys, welcome back to another video where today we are going to answer the question, is the Mako Pro Skiff 17 still a great boat in 2023? Now I've had this boat for just over three years. I've done reviews on it for like the full first year that we had it, like one month, three month, an on water review, my review after the first year. This boat has a lot of pros, a couple of cons, and today we're gonna talk about all of them. Now I wanna start this off by saying this has been a great boat and has honestly checked almost every single box for me the entire time I've had it. Now with anything, there have been issues that I've had. Now I'm gonna talk about those issues today. And for some reason, those always seem to be highlighted when you guys watch these videos and when you comment about it, there's no such thing as a perfect product. The Mako Pro Skiff 17 is no exception to that rule. So we're gonna talk about the pros of it, but I'm also gonna mention the things that may not have worked out quite like I thought they would. We're gonna talk about user errors on my part as a new boat owner for the last three years because there certainly have been a few and things that I could have done differently along the way to affect the performance and maintenance of this boat. We're going to start right here with the Mercury 75 horsepower engine. Now, as many of you know, Mercury engines are, they're, they're workhorses, guys. Let's just be honest. I have kept all the service done on, on this exactly as I should have, gotten the oil changed, the nodes, whatever it is that they do. I'm not mechanically inclined, so I don't want to make it sound like I'm talking something that I don't know what I'm talking about, because as far as the inner workings of this motor, I really don't. The only thing I know is that it is fired up and worked flawlessly each and every time that I've put this boat on the water, and that's really all you can ask for. They did talk me into there. This was a hot topic when we first purchased this boat. Everybody's like, you don't have to get a stainless steel prop. They just upsell you on that. And you really, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. Listen, guys, one of the best decisions I made was getting the stainless steel prop put on here. Would an aluminum prop have worked? Yeah, probably. It probably would have. But this thing has been in salt water almost daily for the last three years and does not have a single speck of rust on it whatsoever. So I am much, much happier having a stainless steel prop on here that I never have to worry about than having something on here that might fade away or give me problems on the water because I don't need problems on the water. I'm not mechanically inclined enough to handle those if they should happen out there. Now I want to talk to you guys about something that if you are a like seasoned boat owner, you probably already know this. As a new boat owner, I did not. For the last probably nine months to a year, I've had some issues with this boat. I would be on the water and it would just die. And it was like the battery was dead, but the battery wasn't dead whatsoever. So I would get in there with a wrench and I would just like hammer down on this thing and like get it tight enough to make it work again. And I really couldn't figure out exactly what was going on. So I took the battery and I was like, maybe the battery's gone bad. I know they can die after so many you know, years. I've never replaced the actual starting battery on this boat. We're gonna get to the trolling motor batteries here in a minute, but I've never replaced that. I take the, took it in, nothing wrong with it. They're like, the battery's in perfect condition. And the guy told me there, he's like, hey, he's like, do you have a kill switch? And I'm like, oh yeah, I know. I'm like, that thing, I keep it off and on. I like, I know that's fine. He's like, well, it's not about that. He said, you have to understand with a boat. He said, they hit the water so hard. He said, those nuts will tend to loosen up. He said, I almost guarantee you, if you get under your console and you look at your automatic kill switch that kills the battery or the power to the whole boat, he said, I almost bet you the nut on it is loose to the touch. He's like, you tighten that up, it'll fix all your problems. So sure enough, got home that day, laid down on the boat, got my head up under the console looking. Guys, this thing was literally hanging on by like a thread. I tightened that nut down, went ahead and tightened everything else down under the center console. Never had another minute issue with it whatsoever. So that was just a little piece of information that if you are like looking into getting a new boat, if you're a new boat owner, make sure that anything that can be tightened or can come loose on its own, that you keep that stuff tightened because it can affect the performance of your boat. And that's just one of those things that I'm never under the console. So it never even dawned on me that there was even gonna be a nut there, which I mean, obviously there is, but I, I was always looking at the battery. I was never looking up at the kill switch. So always make sure all your nuts, bolts, and all that stuff is buttoned down and tightened on your boat from day one. And you can avoid a little bit of headache like I have out on the water. Now, one of the things that is wrong with the boat that is 100% my fault, not anybody else's, not a manufacturing defect, and that is all of these cushions. I was not aware when I bought this boat that you had to like use conditioners and stuff to maintain these seats. So as you can see, the vinyl on my seats are flaking away. Now, I, let's not kid anybody. This is 100% a budget boat. These things only retail for about $22,000. So on a big, nice boat, you probably wouldn't have to use conditioners and stuff like that on them. Maybe you would, I'm not 100% sure. I don't cover my boat. It does sit in the sun all the time. Um, and when I noticed that this was like chipping and kind of tearing, I was like, what in the world's going on? 
Then when I got to looking into it, you are supposed to use conditioners on these to keep them from cracking. Like I probably could have just armor all it and it probably would have been okay, but it was just lack of knowledge on my part. Now, the good thing is I can have that recovered, um, which is something that I'm going to have to do because it does look kind of bad. I mean, I could put duct tape on it, which would be, you know, the, the logical redneck way to fix it, but probably going to go ahead and get the thing recovered here in the very near future. Same thing with the, the helm seat on top of my cooler. Now I am getting ready to do something with the helm seat different. And that's kind of why I wanted to shoot this three year, three year review video today is because very, very shortly, we're going to be making a couple upgrades to the Mako that I'm really, really excited to show you guys. The next two things I'm gonna talk about are probably the only two what I would consider manufacturer defects or issues with the Mako Pro Skiff 17. And that's going to be the front lights, the navigation lights. The, for whatever reason, and I'm not really sure what happened, but these wires have like completely gone bad. I'm not sure why or what. I've always rinsed this thing out religiously. This actually still works because when I take this off and I connect it direct to my battery, this works just fine. But somewhere in between where this is wired in and where the wires come out and actually hit the switch up there, those wires have either dilapidated or corroded. Um, not really sure what's going on with that because those, in my mind, those wires should be coated. Um, but that is definitely an issue. I'm actually in the process right now of getting new lights wired up that I'm gonna put across the bar up front for the red and green lights that you have to have to keep your boat legal. Um, but that's definitely kind of an issue. I don't know if those wires were exposed down there and salt water got to them. Like I rinse this boat off religiously every time i take it out of water salt water i rinse it out and i even go so far as i usually try to take about once every two or three months i usually try to get the mako on a freshwater lake just to run it just to get some fresh water flowing through the engine while it's under full throttle and all that stuff and i've never really had an issue with the engine and the salt water because i do use salt away and i rinse it off but something inside of this wiring system between here and where it comes out and hits the battery has definitely corroded or dilapidated because this no longer works on the mako and of course, the other manufacturer defect that we're going to talk about is the bait well. I mean, there's been no secret that the bait well on these boats suck. You just need to accept the fact if you buy like a 2020, I don't know about 2021, maybe they fixed it. But if you buy a 2020 Mako Pro Skip 17, the front bait well ain't working. I don't care what you do, it's just not going to work. I'm not saying it's acceptable. I'm just saying it is what it is. So you just have to deal with that. But with that being said, I will say this. I have got like a nice angle bait cooler and I really don't mind having a bait cooler, bait box, whatever you want to call it on the boat because I can move it back and forth. Like if I'm in an area where I'm fishing from the back and not the front and I want the bait well back there so I can get the live bait a lot easier, that makes it really, really nice just to be able to kind of move that thing around. Not justifying the fact that the bait well on the boat doesn't work, but I don't mind having the bait cooler. It serves the purpose of what I'm looking for. And if I'm catching like, live menhaden pinfish, something like that to take out to the bridge or wherever we're fishing at that day, I'm probably gonna throw that back in the live well anyways. The live well works perfectly fine. I've never had an issue with the live well running, but you're just not going to get water pumping in to this front bait well after you move this boat at all on the water. And the most asked question about the Mako Pro Skiff 17 really isn't about the Mako at all. It's about this Minn Kota trolling motor. And Let's just be honest, my troubles with the Minn Kota Riptide trolling motor have been very, very, very well documented. Let's not kid anybody because the first one I got, y'all, it was just a lemon. I mean, 100% it was a lemon. Like I told you guys earlier in the video, I'm pretty good about using salt away on all my stuff. I'm, you know, I, I'm pretty frugal and I know I bought a budget boat, but I still want to take care of it. So anytime this thing comes off the water, I'm just drenching the whole thing with salt away and making sure we're doing all the stuff to keep anything from corroding. And that first trolling motor was just terrible. Now, with that being said, this is not a knock on Minn Kota because I will tell you guys, if you've missed those series of videos, after I think the third issue I had with my trolling motor, Minn Kota did replace the unit with a brand new Minn Kota power drive trolling motor. And ever since that has happened, I have not had a single minute's trouble with the trolling motor. I think I just got a bad unit and that happens sometimes. Sometimes you're going to buy things brand new and they're just, they're not good. They have to be replaced and that's okay. That's not a knock on Minn Kota. Where I really appreciated them was the fact that their customer service was second to none through that whole process. Every time I had an issue, I took it right down to Perdido Marine Supply to Doug and those guys. They were amazing to work with every single time. And finally, once we had the third issue, Minn Kota's like, hey, we just want to put a new unit on the boat. There's something wrong with that one. Something's not right. Let's get it replaced. They sent the new one, no problems with the trolling motor whatsoever. Now, this next thing 
is something I want to ask your all's help on. And I need your input on because what I am having trouble with right now is the batteries for this. Now I have had interstate batteries on here, which are, are really good. I've had the batteries, I think they're Duralast that you get. I'm not sure which one comes from which, but I've gotten one at Advanced Auto. I've gotten one at AutoZone and I cannot get these batteries to last more than a year. And maybe that's normal. If that's normal for a trolling motor battery, leave a comment down below because I will tell you guys, this thing does have, I don't know if you can see it right now, but this does have, if Miss PYT will come up here and show the camera, I do have the guest dual charge battery charger built in on this boat. So this stays plugged up when I'm at the house because a lot of the times when I go back up there, the first thing they say is, well, you really need to maintain these batteries if you're not using them. Well, as you guys know, I use these batteries pretty much daily. I mean, let's not kid anybody. I am out on the Mako almost every single day. But even when I'm not out on the Mako, I've got this thing plugged up. So it's doing what they call maintaining the batteries, but I'm still having issues. And the issue I'm having is in my opinion, a little bit rare because my batteries will be working fine. And then all of a sudden, they're not even readable. It just shows a fault on the charger. And if I take it in to try to get it read, it doesn't even read on their little, whatever you call that thing that they check batteries with. So leave a comment down below if you know what's going on with that. While we do have the hatch open, we will talk about the storage. Um, I have went through a loved it, hated it, loved it, and I'm okay with it. That's where we, that's where we are with the storage on the Mako Pro Skip 17. And the reason I went back and forth on that is so many times is because I've learned to make adjustments to make this boat suit my needs by using things that they weren't intended to be used for. So now a lot of the time I use my live well to put fish in. I very rarely have ice in the ice chest back here, which is under the helm seat. So that kind of frees everything up up here because I use all that, I put a lot of stuff in that cooler now, extra life jackets, stuff like that, that doesn't take up room up in the front because I was at a point where I didn't have room for my anchor up there, didn't have room for cast nets, didn't have room for life jackets just because it was so full, especially once I got the two 12 volt batteries put in there after we put the trolling motor in. The other thing that I've done that really helped me out with this boat and made it work much better for me is I put more rod holders on it. Now I made a video where I showed you guys um, I don't know, it's probably been a year ago, where I actually installed these two front rod holders. Best thing I've ever done with this boat, to be honest with you guys. This one right here, you guys have seen me use it a hundred times in videos. If I'm fishing from the front of the boat and I need to retie, or if I've got a fish that I just took off or something like that, this is a straight up and down rod holder. I pop a rod in there, it stands right in front of me. I can drop it down to the water. I don't have to worry about the hook snapping back and getting me. This one is an angle that comes off the front of the boat. This is what I'm gonna use if I'm bridge monster fishing or if I've just got set baits out or something like that. I also added an inset rod holder back in the back and then I got the gear track over there which is what we're going to show you guys right now. I can honestly say I get more questions about this right here. When I have other content creators on the boat, when I have people asking me questions about the Mako that are considering buying one, I, this is definitely the hottest topic on the boat. And I think here's the reason why. Let me explain this to you guys. It's really hard for me to show you from the top down. So I'm gonna show you a B-roll clip right here of what I'm talking about. This rail is not wide enough from the hull of the boat to actually insert a rod holder in there, as you guys can see from that clip. So I was trying to figure out a way where I could add extra rod holders on the side of the boat rather than just in the front deck, or I'm sorry, the front deck or the back deck. I got figured out which way I was on the boat. I completely lost track of time there. So what I did is I went out and I got myself a kayak gear track because it fits perfectly right along this edge. Made sure I use stainless steel bolts to put it on. Made sure I use the, uh, the silicone to put in there. That way it doesn't leak or anything like that. This is made to be a cup holder on a kayak. I will tell you guys, I exclusively use this for lead. Um, that is the only thing that I put in there. I don't know that I've ever sat a drink. The PYT who's back there operating the camera for me, I'm sure she's put like a white claw in there or something because y'all know how much she likes to drink and whatnot. But that's a story for another day. If you don't believe me, just go check out the Coastal Country channel and y'all see what I'm talking about. The girl, I don't, I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm not really worried. I'm just joking with y'all. She don't really drink, but I guarantee you she has put a white claw or two in there, but I use this exclusively for lead and it does work perfectly for that in all seriousness. Um, how many times have you been on your boat and you go to find it, and if you, especially when you're limited on storage? Now, obviously if you've got a drawer or something like that for your lead, 
by all means, that's what you're gonna use. But this thing has no drawers, it has no cabinets, so that's a great place. When I go to Outcast, buy my lead, bring them over, drop them right in there, we're ready to go. I've also got another rod holder set up on this. I have caught bull reds off of this rod holder. You guys have seen it in videos, and it's never broke loose from my gear tracks. So what I'm probably gonna do in the very near future is take one of these, I'm gonna put back here on the backhand side because I would like to have one right here by the seat helm, and I'm probably gonna put two more over there. These are very, very inexpensive, guys. I think I got this one from Yak Attack. It's just a 12 inch gear track. I think you can get them all the way up to 24 inches if you want them. And they fit perfectly right alongside your, whatever this is called, bumper, rail. You guys tell me, leave a comment. What is this called? Like on a boat? Like who knows what this thing right here is called on a boat? And of course, we would be remiss if we did not talk about the old Mako trailer. The trailer has done great. Um, the carpet has come loose a little bit from the bumpers. I need to get under there and just re-tack re that. I know that happens. But obviously the biggest issue I've had with the Mako trailer is the axle that broke. Now, if you guys missed that video, Sarah and I were just driving down the road one day and literally the axle snapped in half right behind the wheel. I had to get an entirely new axle put on this. And this has probably been nine months ago. So this trailer was less than three years old when that happened. And to me, that's just unacceptable. This is made for a salt water situation. So, and I understand that there, it's a, again, it's a budget boat, but at the same time, it should have an axle on there well enough that it's not going to just snap in half with nothing happening to it just driving down the road. That's a little bit crazy, but I did get a new axle put on. Ever since I put the new axle on, it has been fantastic. Have not had any issues at all with that new heavier duty axle. Now, obviously the main reason that I bought the Mako Pro Skiff 17 was to fish from it. And the fishability has never changed for me. This honestly, as far as budget friendly boats go, you're not going to find a better boat for fishing than this boat. And the reason is, is because you have so much open space. You can technically fish four people on this boat. We have done it before. Um, is it uncomfortable? Yeah. You put four grown men on here fishing at the same time, especially if everybody's casting, it can get a little uncomfortable. For two people, you're never gonna get uncomfortable on this boat. One person fishes from the back, one person fishes from the front. We've done that a thousand times on this boat. Never had an issue whatsoever. For fit, so fishability wise, I can't imagine you're going to find a better budget-friendly boat than this one with all the space that you have for fishing. That front deck easily can cast two people if you need to. If you want two in the back, you can put two back here too. But again, one and one works the best, but I think it's about that way with any boat. You've gotta be on a pretty big boat before you get into a situation where you're gonna be standing side by side pretty comfortably fishing all day with somebody else. It's just, you know, it, it's it's realistic to have one person in the front, one person in the back. And then obviously if you get into the longer boats, people can fish from the side. Now, if you're doing drop down fishing or something like that, I mean, you can fish six people off this if you want to. Like if we're out over structure or something like that, kids are with us, I've definitely had lines dropped all over this boat. But two people, very, very comfortable. Four, not quite as comfortable, but it definitely works. But when it's just me out there and I got the whole make out of myself, me and old girl, it's just a dance. Obviously something super important for me with a boat is being able to film from it. Um, and this pretty much checks every box as far as filming goes. And I know that sounds crazy because it's a smaller boat, but, and I'm not saying this applies to everybody. Not all of you are looking into the Mako series or the Pro Skiff 17 series because you're making content. But for me, that was a very, very important piece of it because that's what I use this boat for. I use this boat for work, technically. I go out, I film videos in it almost on a daily basis. So I needed something that was really, really easy to film from. This bar, is the best filming bar I've ever had anywhere. I've been on a lot of boats. You guys have saw, um, I've been very, very blessed to fish with people on boats of all sizes from like 31 foot boats all the way down to like a 10 foot John boat. And I can honestly say that I've never been on a boat that is, is as comfortable to film from as this one. I've got great places for extra lighting when I need it. You guys always call green screen on us. And I'm gonna give you guys a little secret and a little hint right now, because everybody wants to know how we get those pretty, pretty backdrops with those sunrises. And guys, that just comes from our experience in the wedding industry. We know how to set cameras up and you have to have 
lighting because what happens most of the time is if you make your camera bright enough to cover you or you're using a GoPro or something like that, it's gonna completely blow out the background behind you because you've gotta adjust for the subject which is right in front of the camera. Well, what Sarah and I do to counteract that, if we want a really nice shot in the background like what you guys are seeing right here, this is the original intro that I shot for yesterday's video, this is how we get those nice pretty backgrounds. I just have a light on my face right here making me really illuminated so I can set the camera up to be more adjusted to the actual skyline behind me. But I've got plenty of room on this bar right here to make every bit of that happen. I can put lights up here. I've got a cell phone holder up here to take pictures with if I need to. I've got extra room for cameras plus I wear my testy mount. So not that it's going to matter to everybody, but filmability on this boat is kind of second to none. And honestly, there's enough room back here, and I've done this a time or two, to actually set up a tripod over this seat helm. So if I do want to use one of the big cameras, like what you guys are seeing this film on today, and Sarah's not with me that day, I can actually throw one of the big cameras on a tripod right back here. I actually tack it down to the cooler to make sure it doesn't fall off or anything crazy like that. And then we roll on and we film away. So is the Mako Pro Skiff 17 still a great boat in 2023? In my opinion, yes it is. Now I have not looked at any of the newer models to really see kind of what the changes are. I've had a lot of questions the last like two or three months. And I know we're just into that time of the year where a lot of people are looking at boats. And that's kind of why I wanted to shoot this video for you guys here today. I'm not sure what they've changed on the newer models. I don't want to sit here and say they've done this and they've done that because I'm really not sure. I do know a couple news and notes just so you know. Um, they do have a, a 115 option now on the 17 foot Mako. Now used to you could only get and I could be a little off on this, the 60 horsepower motor only went on the 15. You could get a 60 horsepower option on the 17 as well as the 75. The year I bought this, the 60 horsepower option had already went away for the Mako Pro Skip 17. I'm pretty sure in like 2021, 2022, they did redesign the transom on this where it could handle a 115 engine. And then of course the Mako Pro Skip 19, which is two foot longer than this one, only carries that 115 horsepower Mercury. So as far as far as power in the back goes, you're really going to just have to determine what works best for you. I will tell you guys, when we did the on-water review in this boat, I was able to run, I think I got it maxed out at like 35.3 miles per hour, something like that. On average with me and all my gear, and if one other person's on the boat, I'm running somewhere between 30, 32 miles an hour if the conditions are right and I'm wide open. And honestly, I don't need to go any faster than that. I'm not trying to run 100 miles offshore in this boat, and I understand that's super important if you're trying to do that. But for me, this boat is plenty plenty fast enough. So if you guys are in the market for a boat, I get asked this question all the time. Would I still buy the Mako Pro Skiff 17? Absolutely. 100%. In my opinion, there's only one boat out there that's in the same price range that has the same compatibilities that this boat has. And that's going to be your Boston Whaler series. Um, and I think they're a little bit more expensive than this. Now, it's like anything. You can buy this boat with more bells and whistles. I don't have power steering on this boat. You can upgrade to power steering if you want it. Just not something that was that important to me at the time when I purchased And the main reason that I went with the Mako was because of price. It fit every box for me pretty much at the time. And the upgrade options on it that I could do myself were very easy to do. I've never hid from you guys that I'm not very mechanically inclined. So putting in rod holders, adding cup holders, which has ended up turning into pliers and fish grip holders, or putting gear tracks or replacing these little rod holders on the side, all that stuff is super easy to do on this boat. And that was one of the most important boxes for me was if I wanted to do stuff to this myself, it had to be a pretty simple process just because I'm not mechanically inclined enough to like take the boat apart, put the stuff in and take it back together. I mean, I actually had to go get somebody to help me put my new fish finder in when I replaced the old hummingbird I had with the Lowrance just because I didn't know. I mean, it ended up being extremely simple and I was kind of embarrassed when I got over there because when we pulled it out and I realized what we were doing, I was like, crap, I very, very easily could have done this myself. Um, but it, now I can, but even something as simple as that, I wasn't sure I could do myself. Obviously it was very simple because there was already a transducer in there. I wasn't even considering the fact that we were just gonna tie a rope to it, pull it out and then pull it back through. But uh, overall, yes, I would buy the Mako Pro Skiff 17 over and over and over again. Does it check every box still? Maybe not. I may have outgrown this boat just a little bit, but I haven't outgrown this boat enough to justify going out and buying a new boat. Everything I wanna do on a day-to-day -day basis in my fishing life, in my 
personal life with my family, this boat covers for us. We can go out and cruise in it, we can fish in it, we can definitely make content in it. And it's a great boat for our channel. Guys, that's all I got for you. I truly hope I answered all the questions you guys have sent out and been asking us about here lately. If not, leave a comment down below, let me know. I'll be more than happy to do another one of these in a couple months and let you guys know. For the OGs of the channel, this should take y'all back, man. This is what we used to do. We used to hop on the Mako and we used to talk about it. And that's what brought a lot of you guys to the channel. We appreciate you for still being here. We appreciate all the new people that are coming in. Thank you guys so much for all your love and support. And as always, make sure you find a way to make somebody smile today. You never know. It just might change the world. We can't wait to see y'all on the next one. Y'all take care and we'll see you soon.